speaking with you, Mr. Mason. Can I just ask you for the Hansard record to state your name and the capacity in which you appear today? Uh, Stephen Andrew Mason is my name. I'm a current Brumbies franchisee here in Canberra with um, three, three franchises. Um, I'm also a member of the, um, the, the Franchisee Advisory Committee that um, meets with Retail Food Group to try to assist them to you know, make changes to the network and better facilitate changes that actually is meaningful to the franchisees on the ground. Okay. Um, I've been on that committee for around four years. Okay. During that period of time, I've worked with people from the previous administration um, when Tony Alford was in charge through to now the current CEO, Richard Hinson. Okay, thanks um, for so much, Mr Mason. I might call you Steve for the remainder yeah, of that's certainly. okay. Uh, Mr Burke, do you want to do the same? Just state your name and the capacity in which you appear today. Yep, um, Aidan Andrew Burke and um, currently unemployed. <laughs> so I'm just uh, just here to, to give You're some information. You're here in your own capacity? Sorry? You're here in your own capacity? Yeah. Okay. And I might call you Baden if that's okay? For the no problem. Of well, um, the committee uh, is only, I just want to reiterate, is only hearing evidence in relation to this inquiry into the Franchising Code of con Conduct. Um, gentlemen, do either or both of you have an opening statement you'd like to make before we start with questions? I'm, I'm happy to go straight to questions. Okay, Steve, yep. Baden, you're yep. happy too? As well. Senator Williams, do you want to kick us off? Yeah, thanks, gentlemen. Thanks for your presence. Mr Mason, I launched this inquiry after media and complaints and so on, and there's, there's been a lot of good things we've heard about from McDonald's and other franchisors and a lot of bad things. Tell us your experience about the bad things you, you've... Uh, experienced during your time as a franchisee and what we can do to help make it better for the future? Um, Senator Williams, I've, I've been involved with Brumby's brand for 14 years. Um, Baden and I were originally business partners up until about three years ago. Um, when we started the businesses together, the businesses were very good businesses, quite profitable, easy to run, a lot of support. Um, you know was the major reason most people entered into those type of arrangements. That was when Mr Sherlock owned Brumbies? Yeah, Michael Sherlock was the, go, was, was the owner then. Um, and then about six or seven years ago, Retail Food Group um, came in and acquired Brumbies as a brand. Um, and I'm fairly, I'm not exactly 100% positive, but I'm fairly confident that um, RFG f either floated on the stock market shortly thereafter or had already floated on the stock market at that point. And, when they acquired Brumbies. Um, when Retail Food Group acquired Brumbies, um, there was a lot less transparency. Um, there was a lot less profitability. Um, Let me stop you there. There's a lot less profitability. What did RFG do to take away your profit profitability? The ma major problem, Senator Williams, is that um, under RFG's um, banner or under RFG's management, uh, there are a lot of rebates that we have no idea how we can quantify what they are. Um, In other words, you're saying the franchise or RFG, when they took over from Mr Sherlock's organisation, charged you a lot more? Indirectly they did. Indirectly what happened was the profitability of the businesses disappeared out the back door. So whilst the 8.5% was still there on the what, what they quantify as top line sales, um, that didn't change. What was the 8.5%? The 8.5% is 6% for the licence fee to, to have the, the sign above your door. Of turnover? And, yeah, and 2.5% and as a, uh, a marketing levy. Um, so the 8.5%, they, they did actually try to increase that to 10%, but there was that much pushback um, at the time that they, they, they decided to leave it at 85 But But what, what happened shortly thereafter was the costs of, of everything skyrocketed. Um, what happened after that was that the services were stripped What out. is everything? Your flour, your yeast, uh, your inputs yeah, that RFG drinks, supplied to you? Absolutely, yeah. In particular, the big ticket items like flour. Um, and to, to, to com compound that issue, um, RFG started to, to maintain its profitability, started to strip the services out that they offered. Like um, at one point they sacked all the people that 
were called business development managers, the BDMs. They took them all out of the field and replaced them with a team of, um, I think it was two. They had, I think they had 16 BDMs across Australia who serviced the network that had shrunk fairly dramatically at that point. Um, and they replaced that with a call centre. Now, they tried to sell that to the franchisees as a wonderful innovation that was going to be so great for all the people for all these reasons, et cetera, et cetera, but nobody bought that. And there are a number of other number of other things that, that happened around that time where costs were just stripped and um, you know support was taken away and so on and so forth. The brand basically eroded um, eroded away over a period of about five or six years. Like I think when they took over, it was around 400 stores under Michael Sherlock. Um, we're now down to 170. So reading from what you've just told the committee, Mr Mason, would you say the, the change from franchisor Sherlock to franchisor R RFG was a disaster. Oh, absolutely. And, and I mean, it's well documented across the other brands that they've acquired as well, in particular Michelle's, Patisserie, Gloria Jean's. Like the attrition rate in terms of the erosion of their network is, is staggering. You know, I, and I actually watched um, when Richard Hinson was in here um, uh, with Mark Connors and um, Colin Archer and so on and so forth. and. Look, you know, th th those gentlemen that are there, they're trying to portray a, 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 a bunch of brands that are together um, that, that, that uh, are looking after a bunch of really happy people and franchisees and so on and so forth. Um, Mr Hinson quoted statistics about a survey where he'd gone out and pressed the flesh with 700 franchisees of the 1,350 people that he'd met on the road show and so on and so forth. That's a fact. Um, and he quoted a statistic that it was around about 70% of the network were happier um, after they had been to the road shows and that they saw a brighter future, et cetera, et cetera. Well, um, I put it to you that that simply isn't the case. Um, on the Franchise Advisory Committee that I sit on, there's nine other members. Um, we would have in total over 120 to 150 years experience. One lady's been there for 35 years. Um, she's down to one store and um, she had seven at one point and um, we met with uh, RFG in September in Sydney four, four or five weeks ago. Um, I've spoken to all those people at length and there's nobody who's happy in that room with, with the changes that are supposedly being made and so on and so forth. So it's another raft of, um, I wouldn't say they're empty promises because there are changes happening. But those sorts of things are just not happening fast enough. They're not happening fast enough to, to be able to um, make a, a meaningful difference to the people that are out there with their um, houses and things like that on the line for security. And, you know, there's... Look, if you went and knocked on the doors of the 170 Brumbies franchisees right now and said, are you happy with your choice of your business, your investment and so on and so forth, I'd, I think it would be less than 15 or 20% of people who would, would have anything positive to say. Mr. Mason, I find this amazing what you're saying because you're still a brand, you're still a Brumbies franchisee. That's right. You're working with RFG. Yeah. And you've got the courage to come along here and speak the truth, and I thank you for that. I want you to do me a favour. If there are any repercussions for you being frank and honest to this committee, will you please inform us? Thank you, Senator. Yeah, now, well, talking about roadshows, Mr. Burke, you were taking on a roadshow or two, weren't you? <laughs> Motor racing gear and everywhere like that. Tell a committee about your story. You were partners with Mr Mason. You had three stores under the Sherlock Fr uh, Brumbies, is that correct? That's correct, yeah. You are doing well. Yeah. Tell us what happened to your life when it comes to retail food group, Mr Alford, etc. All right. Well, look, I'll, I'll cut straight to Mr Alford. Um, uh, Tony's PA first contacted me and invited me to a car race, um, V8 car races, and... Um, um, I just thought, oh yeah, great. Went, went along to it and um, when I got there, there was only myself and a Donut King franchisee from Sydney there and I, I, I thought, oh, this is pretty special. Um, now, he also um, does a little bit of cycling and that was my history as well. So we sort of, you know, I, he became, well, I thought we be, were mates. So this went on for... A, you and Mr Alford? Yeah. Yeah. Go on. Yeah, Tony and I, yeah. So, um, um, 12 months or so had gone by. Um, we'd done a few of these things. I went to, he, my son used to fly with me as well up to his, his place. We'd have 
um, you know, the Christmas parties and, and that sort of stuff. Pretty flash place? Very flash place, yeah, yeah. Um, so a um, couple of Lamborghinis there. Really? Um, <laughs> very nice. Now... Um, wasn't plain label wine you're drinking, that sort of stuff? It's, no. Yeah. yeah. Just, Go on, yeah. Let's just stick to the substance. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so, look, we... We, um... Mm. You, you I trusted... You were being wined and dined for a reason. I think that's yeah. what you said. Look, and I, yeah, and I and I've been brought up to trust people, you know, and I just I just thought he actually did like me, and he was a, he was a friend. Um, so when it was sort of put to me this idea about setting up a company to take on the um, company stores, the Brumbies company stores, uh, I'm thinking, well, fuck, no no one does it any better than I do, the the and and the big fella. Um, so I, I sort of, I was, yes, I was interested straight away. Now, um, so for the committee's information, RFG owned these Brumby stores, they were yep. company stores, yep. and he asked you to take on the management of them. That's right. How many stores? There was, it was around 10 stores. It couldn't be exact because there were some that they just had the lease on that weren't operating, you know what I mean? So, and I could pick really which ones I wanted to take. And I, my comment was, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it properly for the brand, Brumby's brand. So, um, um, and now we, um, so I went about putting together a team um, for BB's management team um, to run these, to run these stores. Um, actually, so I'll just, you I'll were just approached by Mr. Alpha to take yeah. on these stores. These stores were battling a bit. You could get them going. Yep. Okay, and you formed a company and you did that? Yeah. Now, Go back on. up. I'll back up a little bit, because when I first looked at it, I thought, there is no way this is going to work. No way. Um, you know, I'm happy with the three stores I've got. We're making reasonably, reasonably good money. Um, so then the offer sorry, was can support. I just, sorry, can I just interrupt? Sorry, excuse my ignorance. So was this to take on an additional 10 or so stores as the franchisee or as, as a manager on behalf of RFG, which held them? Well, no, yeah, I, so I set up a company and I was managing, so, but the, the staff, the money in the tills, the, the stock was all mine. They held the head lease okay. on it. I was paying it. Um, I the, was paying on the, the on the additional On the additional stores? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I just, yeah. yeah. But, and the difference between being a franchisee, as I was in these three stores in, in Canberra, is instead of paying franchise fees, they were paying me to do it. So if I run a good show, I could actually make some money. Um, now the numbers... How was that, how was that calculated, Baden? Like how, what was the payment calculated on? Were you paid a set amount to manage them? or yeah, were you, yeah, yeah. Plus an incentive uh, yep. based so, on how they were operating? There was an original $1,000 per store take on, $750 per week ongoing um, per store. Um, and that sort of didn't cut it because it was it, those I couldn't turn these things around instantly. So then they threw in twenty thousand dollars as a loan. I had two years sort of repayment interest free on that on that loan. Um, and that per, was for each store. Per store, yeah, that's correct. Um, so that was starting to get a bit more attractive. We're still still sort of negotiating. Before we got to that point, when Tony first. T told me it was over a, a beer at his place, um, and it was. I was uh, at first I was thinking, "Yep, this this might be able to work. This might be able to work." But when he said Alicia was setting up the same thing with um, Donut, King. Donut Kings and Michelle's, who's Alicia? Alicia Atkinson, Atkins, Atkinson. It's Is his she partner. Had a company it's, called Exit Fifty Seven. That's correct. Yeah. Go on. Once, as soon as he said that, I knew they were together, so I thought, well, he's not going to burn her. I'm pretty safe, I'm, like, as long as I get the numbers right. So to be clear, Ms Atkinson is Mr Alford's partner? Yeah, yeah. As in life partner, partner, not business partner, as in personal partner. partner. No, yeah, um, girlfriend, boyfriend. Yeah, OK. Right. Yeah. Um, so it was... At the last deal, that before we started this, this arrangement, the last deal was um, an agreement of $800,000, okay, as a loan 
as a business loan to buy my business partner out here in Canberra of the three stores here. That was the last part of the, of the thing. That never happened. It, ne it was, um, I asked and we what, talked. What was the rationale for that, babe? Why was Can that I, part of it? So, yeah, okay. Yeah. So what, what happened there um, was that, uh, my, my background is not accounting, but finance basically. And Baden came to me and, and we'd been in business already for 10 years at that point. <clears throat> and we had three successful stores, which, I, which I've taken over. Um, and he said, look, they want me to go and open up or take over their company stores. Um, now, mate, correct me if I'm wrong, but yeah. my understanding was that, was that whilst Baden didn't own the stores, he was wholly responsible for everything to do with those stores financially. He paid the wages, the super, the rent, um, Insurance. towards the end, licence fees as well. Um, the deal that was offered to him and the deal that he ended up with in the end were, were, were poles apart. Um, and he came to me and said, look, I think this is a great opportunity for initially for both of us. I said, there's no way in the world I'm going to touch that with the barge pole. So, some of those stores were doing $4,000 a week. And Sorry, Steve, can I just jump in, Baden? So, so when we say the deal, are you, is this a... Uh, are you now referring to discussions you had had, the deal being your informal discussions, or was this all we, documented? Because you're no, saying yeah, the, what, what you agreed and what ended up being what, occurring were different. Yeah, there was... At any point in time... I'm is just, there any documentation? Any way we can verify that difference? The, um, yeah, look, we, we have... I've got sort of... I've got plenty of... Plenty of sort of stuff there in my diary. Um, but I'm talking. I'm talking. You, you, you know, know email. No, there's no contract. No contract. No other correspondence that no. would show contemporaneously yeah. what was agreed. Yeah. No, it was all verbally. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Continue. So, so at that point, I just said to Baden, I said, look, if, if you intend to go down this path, you need to find a way to to get me out of this because I could see there was a train wreck. And um, like, no disrespect, but I, but I knew he was going to end up bankrupt, and I didn't want to be dragged into that scenario. And I told him that. I told him that a number of times. Um, but I think Tony Alford is quite a persuasive person, um, and I think I was giving Baden one side of a story, and he was getting another side of a story elsewhere. Yeah, he's not um, talking to you, he doesn't want to talk to us. Well, no, he didn't he talk to me either. <laughs> he, di he didn't talk to me either. He, I think, they target people that they know that they can. You know, they assess people. Um, anyway, um, so that that money was meant to be forthcoming within you know six to eight weeks, and there were so many little roadblocks along the way, so many hoops we had to jump through, and so on and so forth. And it Sorry, got to this the, is the, the when you say money, the loan to buy the, you the out. loan, yeah, the, the loan. Eight hundred thousand. That's right. The, which was buy, which was paying you out, and was a loan that you were taking. That's and right. Was that on commercial terms, Baden? That loan. The the eight hundred thousand. Yeah. No. It, yeah. It was, a, it was a, just a loan directly with RFG. Um, was there an he, interest rate? And yeah, there was an interest rate okay. on it, yeah. Um, anyway, but Mr yeah. Mason is verifying that you came to him describing this whole deal and, and you have an enduring sense of trust in the truth of Mr Burke's comments. Oh, absolutely. There's no question I, in my mind. Um, I, I, I've seen figures on emails and so on and so forth of... Um, uh, it was seven hundred and fifty thousand. So you know, Baden obviously had something he wanted to do with the other fifty. But the uh, agreement was two hundred and fifty thousand dollars per store, um, and originally it was meant to take six to eight weeks. And there are emails to verify these. Well, I, I don't have those. Okay. But but the figures were bandied around. The figures were bandied back and forth between mm -hmm. us. And I imagine at some point there there would have been email communication between somebody in 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 RFG's office and Baden. Um, to do with that, but I have no, no, there's no doubt in my mind whatsoever. Look, we were asked to go through our, our three companies that we had, each, each one of our, our stores operates under a separate company, and we were asked to go through and clear off all the, um, I just can't think what it is off the top of my head, but um, it's a four letter acronym for when a, it's like an AAPS or an APPS or something like that. When, when you borrow money to, to buy a vehicle or some motor equipment or something like that, they take a lien over. Um, the equipment and they register their interest against your company. Um, and the, the legal department at RFG said, look, you know, you need to get through and clear all this. You need to clear that. You need to do this. And there were emails that came through from the legal department to Baden about, 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 about that. So they're the documents. 
So there's no question that... So there's documents somewhere about this? Absolutely. In RFG system, there will be documentation of this. Mm. Um, look, you know, having said that, naively, as Baden said, both of us were raised to take people at their word and your handshakes, your bond and so on and so forth. So yep. we haven't kept that documentation. So just excuse... I'm relatively new to, the, to this um, committee and therefore this... Uh, the whole work we've been doing here. So, Baden, you know, you, you refer to sort of informal discussions that then led to, um, you know, some of the interaction with that obviously required legal work to affect the transaction, which was essentially, as far as I can tell, was you didn't want a bar of it, Steve, so you said, I'm out, Baden, you've got to buy me out. Yeah. What was the rationale? What, what did they say to you, Baden? You, you know, you're just one of our best franchisees. We want you to turn these around, they're all underperforming, they're doing it tough, you're the yeah. guy that's going to do this for us, we're going to give you 20 grand up front, plus we're going to pay you, what was a 1000 bucks per store, plus up front, plus 750 per week. Per week yeah. on, yeah. But you're going to assume everything else. Yeah. 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 Okay, and, you know, that all sounds, you know, I, I, you know, I can understand they'd want a, you know, a really great franchisee to perhaps do these things. Yeah. Um, now, presumably, you got into those stores and... So, but based on those discussions, Steve, you know, I'd say you two are in partnership. Steve, you could see, irrespective of what was being said, this doesn't stack up. No. Baden, you know, why do you think you didn't form that conclusion? Uh, look, I'm a baker. It's my passion. Um... And a hot bread shop is, is, like, I've been doing it since I was 15. That's what I do. Um, so I, um, I just, I, look, you know, I've been very lucky I've had Steve with me for when I was in business for 10 years, taking care of the back end of the business. Um, but um, so the big fella didn't want to go, come in with it, so I needed to find some, someone as smart as him to, 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 run, to run that side of it. So, look, I quickly got a general manager um, who, he was the general manager for Donut King for 16 years, I think, under RFG. So he knew the RFG setup, um, And he, so, so that he put, he sort of was my Steve in, Steve Mason in, in BBMT. Um, and look, leading up, and that last, sort of two, two or so months of BB's management team, we were, we were going up to head office in Retail Food Group, proposing, which is under them, they've, they've asked BB's management team to do it, to run Brumbies, run, the, run all of it. Because clearly the, the stores run under BB's management team, where they've increased 15 to 20% in that short period of time that we had them. So, so how long did you have them, Mr Burke? I th look, uh, I th the whole show was only about 12 months, the, the whole setup. Um, but well, we turned them around straight away. As soon as you put a bit of love into it and, and you've got someone, someone, you know, in there motivating the staff. How many stores was it in the end? Look, in the end there was, including the three with, with Steve, there was 19 altogether. The, sorry, that, that was separated out. So, yeah, the, so the, the, the ones you took on. Okay. BB's management team ended up with 15. That, that's your business? Yeah. So you took 10 loss-making corporate stores on. Yep. Where are the additional ones from? The other ones, they come in. They were new stores that they couldn't get a franchisee. This is where BB's management team could have worked. So if they get a good site, they can't find a franchisee, we go in there, we open it up, it's for sale. All those stores were for sale the whole time. Right. Um, so we would never stop a franchi potential franchisee from coming in there. So you Did started they sell those stores? Sorry? Did they sell those stores when it went we bad for you? We, we sold one. And when, I, when we sold one during my term, um, up in New, uh, New, Red, uh, Queen, North of Brisbane. Yeah, that's quite sad. Yeah. Um, so that was the only one that we could that we sold. Um, I think I think the relevance or the most relevant point that, that I remember about this, and the most staggering thing that I remember about this, and um, you know, this is really going into some dangerous territory, um, is that Baden was offered 15 stores, 
Now, if retail food group's intention was to really to, to, to have a situation where um, they wanted those stores turned around, um, built up, uh, staff mentored all the things that they spoke to them about, and then returned to the network under a new franchisee, right? The business model you can kind of see all that works, and you say, okay, well, here's a guy who's a great operator. He's been a in a bakery for thirty odd years. Yes. Um, if anyone can do it, he can do it. The biggest issue Retail Food Group faced when they took over Brumbies was they never managed manufacturers. We are manufacturers. Everything else they have is what they call freezer to oven. So nobody else makes. They don't even make pizza bases at crust. They come in. Um, from, from what I gather. Um, but they held back three stores that were company stores that were all turning around, turning over around $20,000 a week, which were profitable stores. Now, you know, there was also... Sorry, uh, Steve, but that, that's not surprising, is it? Because you, well, you, you're well, going to get Baden to come in and look after the ones nice. that need turning around, not the ones that are operating well. Because these um, are sort of a hired gun to come in and fix these... Yeah. You know, because you've got the proven track record. Yeah. Well, I guess I guess what I'm alluding to is that if if they were genuine about giving him uh, the opportunity to succeed, surely they would have passed those on as part of the bargain. Um, there was a lot of rumour and innuendo flying around about that time that um, that exit 57 that Alicia Atkinson uh, was responsible for running and BBMT as well was purely a vehicle just to remove. Um, negative cash flow from from their bottom line in order to, um, like I said, we're getting into some fairly heavy duty territory here, but um, I don't know this for a fact, but I'm, I'm just letting you know that there was room and innuendo r rife within the network. Um, why don't that, you, Steve, why don't you stick to the things that you know and okay. your own experiences, yeah. Um, on, oh, look, on that note, um, in Tony's office, Tony Alford, it, uh, he he let me know that that mate we've got this deal going on with uh, we're we're going to do glory jeans it's not public keep it to yourself um you know again i thought we were mates now after a period of time i've said to him mate what's going on with gloria jeans you know we're, we're, can we talk about it yet oh i just got to make the numbers work i just got to you know it'll happen i just got to make the numbers work sorry ben you were keen to you were keen to dip your toe in the glory of Germans. No, no, you, you not were, interested. No, sorry, not interested. So you were just asking out of curiosity. Well, mates, yeah, in his office, yeah, sorry. and we were just look. I would ask him for advice. I'm going to tell you a quick story. The first time I asked him, Tony Alford, Mr. Alford, for advice, he leaned across the table. He thought about it. He leaned across the table and said, looked at me square in the eye and said, "Don't trust anybody." Sounds like That's, good advice. I oh, know. That's a man talk. Yeah, I should. I should have. He, I didn't realise he was referring to I should have ran then. Um, so, but it was once Gloria Jeans happened, I kept, oh, look, for the life of me, I do not think we have spoken since. Not a message, not a text message, nothing. Once Gloria Jeans purchase went through. Um, so, so let me I stop just... you there, Mr. Yeah. Berg, are you saying that you were brought in to clean up the bad ones, to get them off the books, so they could then set themselves up in Gloria Jeans. Oh, that's what I reckon, yeah. Okay. You had all these stores. Yep. What happened then when they, you couldn't repair them, you couldn't get them back on their feet, they were not going well. What assistance did you get from RFG? Um, look, no, that, that's not quite right. They, they were going well, and um, they were very, they were being, becoming profitable, and BB's management team was growing. Um, and we were in meetings with Retail Food Group with Andre Nell, um, Gary Alford, um, taught, discussing those two mainly, discussing BB's management team taking over the brand, running, managing the brand. Now, we were, we, we, we like I, I went up there, put a business plan, a proposal to him under that the, they've asked me to do it. Sorry, they, Baden, is Gary Alford related to? Brother. Brother, Sorry. yeah. Um, they've then sent me away and said, just tweak it a bit, because it was a bit, it w wasn't show full enough. So I uh, spent a bit of time with my accountant here in Canberra and um, put, put together the show for them, went back up there. They loved it, loved the idea. Gave them the whole structure of, of how I would run Brumbies um, as a brand. Then it was within a week was when BB's management team ended within a okay. week of that. 
This is obviously a very sad story. But tell me this, as regulators of this committee, what do we need to put in place to see that bad behaviour and these things don't happen again to people in the future? Sorry we can't compensate you. No, Sorry, okay. did they bankrupt you? Absolutely. RFG pursued you for bankruptcy? Yep. It did. Sorry, what was that? RFG pursued you for bankruptcy? No, they didn't. Cred other creditors? Other creditors, yeah. Okay. What can we do to see that this doesn't happen again um, for the future? In RFG's case? Yep, yep, that's what you know about. Yeah, yeah that's what that's. Um, so look, for RFG, um, look, I don't know. I've been out of it for three years now, but um, under the, the when I was there, RFG, the top, they they were trying to control the franchisees as well. They were, they've got, they should put their general manager of their brand, each brand should have 100% autonomy to run that brand. That's what they get paid to do. Uh, get a, you know, someone with a bit of passion, a bit of go about them. If they don't do that, if they don't perform after 12 months or so, then you know, move them on or move them to another brand or whatever. But, um, but Tony Alford, at the time when I was with RFG, Tony Alford was pulling the strings on everyone, the whole show. So the, the, we had a couple of good um, general manager, general managers um, come uh, through. Man managing directors. Managing directors yeah. come through all Brumbies. They didn't last. They didn't last because they, they tried to run it properly. This is all good, but I come to the point. As regulators, what do we need to change? Do we need to change a code of conduct? Do we need to change behaviour? Do we need to have ACCC train people? Do, 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 do we need to have people educated better? Do we, do we need to have more disclosure and transparency of the books, the figures, yeah. the turnover? What do we do? to see in the future that people like you, Mr Burke, who know the industry and have worked hard, don't get put through bankruptcy and perhaps you might be able to help us as well, Mr Mason. Yeah. So um, the, the major issue there at the moment is, is there is no transparency. Uh, transparency- Expand on that. It, it doesn't exist. Um, it, it's impossible to calculate the true cost of your relationship with, with, with Retail Food Group. Um, because you've got so many different revenue streams that are coming out of your business going back to RFG. Um, you know, I think rebates were never really a, a massive issue in the Sherlock era. You know, and I, I've listened to Richard Hinton sit here and say, well, you know, we're, we're right on or below or on the average of industry benchmarks in terms of our licence agreements, in terms of our the rebates we collect, in terms of... Um, things like the training levies that we enforce and so on and so forth. Well, that may be the case, but the situation is because they're in line with the industry benchmarks doesn't mean that those, those fees and charges and so on and so forth are appropriate for, for what they put back into the businesses or, in fact, give the businesses a, a true ability to be able to, to thrive in this economic climate that we're in. Okay, one question. Have you seen franchisees go broke the franchise will take it back and then sell that same franchisee again, yeah. knowing full well it's in a disastrous position mm. or, so, you know, or whatever. So, Senator Williams, we have a, an instance here in, in Canberra um, where a site here in Canberra has been through four sets of hands in less than six years. And how much does RFG make every time they sell that store? Well, I, I don't think that's, that's their... Motivation? No, I don't think that's their motivation. I think their motivation purely is to um, is to keep somebody in there paying rent, because they hold the head lease in the majority of, of Brumby's cases. And they can't um, get out of it, so they find some bunny to exactly exploit. Exactly. And if that means that you lose your house, that's too so bad. Yeah, so sad. That's right. Do so they hold the head lease on your three stores. Yeah, they do. So in other words, if you walked out tomorrow, they 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 hit for the rent each week, and no one there paying them. That's right, but, but the, the issue is if I, if I walk away, I, I walk away with nothing. Mm. I have nothing to sell because I have no control. Um, look, the, th that's another issue, uh, the fact that the franchisors, you know, in this model, hold the head lease. Well, just let me stop you there, Mr Mason. You have nothing to sell if you walk away. What did you pay for your franchisees? Oh, to enter into the arrangements? Yeah. Um, 
when well, you're, look, when I you're think we paid. We, we, we mm. did fairly well in terms of um, the way we entered the, the the situation because we purchased our first uh, franchise for around about two hundred thousand, but that was sold from another franchisee to us internally, um, and then. We actually had a, a, another bakery that we had um, here in Canberra that wasn't a Brumbies franchise, so we had to convert that. And then we put, so there was no real cost involved there. It might have been around 15 grand or something like that to, 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 to sign up, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, but we already owned that, that business. And then we purchased the third store for, I think it was 230 or something like that. Um, at this location that I was talking about in, um, in Canberra here, um, the first person spent in excess of four hundred thousand dollars to set the store we up. Went broke. They lasted nine months. Go on. So from there, I'm fairly confident that Retail Food Group. Actually, I know that because Baden and I were supplying the bread. They couldn't get bakers and they couldn't get staff. So we helped them keep the business open um, because back then the, the climate was, you know, uh, the climate was buoyant enough to support the company stores. Most of the company stores still limped along and made some money or covered because they weren't paying their eight and a half percent license fee back to themselves, um, and so then that went through um, another set of hands there, um, which was actually Baden, who was a proven um, operator um, across you know as a multi-site franchise. That was one of the fifteen he took on, yeah. That's right. Oh well, well, no, it was, it was roughly around that time. Um, and then it went. They they left. They walked away. It went back to a company store, and then they sold that again um, to another lady who was here in Canberra, um, who had not been a franchisee but had worked in the Brumby system for a very long time. Um, so, when you consider Did you know how much she paid, uh, no, I, I don't have that information. Sorry, but, but it was significantly less than four hundred thousand. It was probably circa fifty thousand, something right. like Did that. Did she go broke? Yeah. Right. Yeah, I think she lasted over over 12 months, but took about $150,000 worth of debt um, in that period of time, which um, RFG are pursuing her for a large chunk of money at the moment. Um, so, you know, when you consider just that particular example itself, um, where you've got four, well, a company store being run by the company itself, as well as um, two fairly exp experienced franchisees who have run stores successfully, um, you know, the fact that it went down under those circumstances that many times over such a short period of time, for me as, as a private, you know, as a privately owned uh, bi businessman, I suppose, or somebody who, you know, I'd look at that and just go, well, that, that's, uh, there's no way in the world that's sustainable. So one of the recommendations, Mr Mason, is there should be some register of the actual sites and the frequency of journey. Yeah. That would be a helpful thing for oh, look, people. Ab to... Absolutely. I mean, I, 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 what, what I would like to see personally is I would like to see the companies like Retail Food Group go back into those stores, return those stores to profitability before they're allowed to put another and, and be able to demonstrate that those stores are profitable stores before they're allowed to put somebody else in there. Right. And if not, look, they choose the sites, they do this you know, enormous although, process. Although, of... sorry to interrupt, Steve. Um, Baden, you referred earlier to some of the stores that you had taken on as part of the management exercise, yep. that you, you actually turned them around pretty quickly. You said yeah. the staff needed mentoring, obviously yeah. you bought. So they were unprofitable that you, with a, obviously some know-how, you turned profitable. Yeah. Now presumably, Steve, that's you know, not, Look, I'd, not I'd, uncommon. I'd, I would say it's very uncommon, to be honest. I really would. I mean, w when you consider, um, when you consider the way that most Perhaps of these... in an example where you've got where it's been churned over four or six or five or six times, but it's not inconceivable that you have a location that you, you've got an operator that you know, you know, for whatever reason it hasn't worked out for them, but someone. Yeah, maybe on the first cycle, but once you'd been through two cycles, you'd you'd be asking a lot of questions. I would I would imagine. But I don't think anyone. I, I, I mean, I'm speaking from my own perspective, not the committee's here. You know, disclosing how many times a site has turned over, I think, would is eminently sensible. Yeah. And surely you'd ask for the books. Well, I guess that's the, the thing. profit and loss, the turnover, the cost, etc. Yeah, surely people are not going to go and buy a franchisee if it's someone's walked out and done it tough. Mm. Without seeing the books, but perhaps they do. 
Um, I spoke to another um, person who's a friend of mine in the network who uh, took over a store um, in Queensland and um, he said to me words exactly the same to the effect, the same as the lady who um, was the last person through the store here in Canberra. Um, basically what he was given was 12 months worth of turnover and the rent. Um, now when Richard Hinson was here, he said they went through a 22 step process that took 180 days to ascertain whether or not sites were suitable and so on and so forth. I just don't understand how that can be watered down to 12 months worth of what they call top line sales and a rental figure. Yeah. To my, Burke, to my way of thinking, that's, that's, not, that's not due diligence. When it all looked like turning to tears, Mr Burke, what support did you get from RFG? Yeah, nothing. Nothing. Did you ask them for help? Yes. Look, the last store that I had, because I was, I was out of the, the three Past with Steve, year. BB's management team was down, OK? I had one store that was, that was here in Canberra. Um, Sorry, when you say down, what do you mean, Baden? When it was gone into liquidation. Okay. It was, um, yeah, administrators in, in administration. But um, now, and that, and now that happened because once, um, once RFG bought Gloria Jeans, that's when things change and all of a sudden BB's management team had to start paying exactly like a normal franchisee. Right. So, uh, the so assistance. This is what I want to understand. So, yeah, you, you said in 12 months you increased the turnover by 15% yeah, and this correct. was a successful business model. Correct. Then there was a critical moment where something changed and you no longer got the deal to have $1,000, no, 750 per week. Exactly. Payment of no franchise fees. Yep. Okay, and, so what, what did they do then? That then? ended. And we sat there on our, on our, you know, weekly, fortnightly meeting with the, with, with RFG, with myself and my general manager, and um, Gary Alford stood up, and I knew that something was on because he was the man that did the hard stuff. And he said, "Baden, I'm uh, I'm sorry, um, BB's management team is going to have to start paying license fees. The the deal's off." And I said, "Good, Tony needs to be here because he's the one I made the deal with." Someone went out. He was busy. Never happened. This went on. We sat there for half an hour or so. And I said, "Look, it's not sustainable. It's not going to happen if 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 this arrangement." If, if you expect the BB's management team, well, just a couple of days ago, we we're talking about running the brand. Um, now you're telling me that that's all off the table and, and there's supports off the table and I've got to start paying eight and a half percent. It's not gonna work. I had three shops in Perth, three shops in Cairns. It's not gonna, I can't, it, it won't work. Um, Mr. Burke, earlier in your evidence to us this evening, you were a little unclear about the documentation that you might have access to. Can I just get you to reconsider, you know, after tonight, what mm. documents you might be able to get a hold of? Because I do note in your submission, you have um, a, a letter embedded in here from the managing director that says, further to your recent discussions, please find attached draft documents setting out the key terms of the proposed manager agreement for our discussion and meeting tomorrow. Um, you also have some evidence from the senior legal counsel. So you, you might well be able to, on reflection, go and find us some documentation okay. that will verify the arrange arrangement that you entered into. Yep. Um, and then we can have a look and see sort mm. of what terms and what happened when this when this change occurred, if that was allowed within that contract. Uh, but I, I would just like to ask you um, a couple of questions around the BB management team. And if you can't answer them tonight, it's okay, take them on notice, okay? Yeah. But was your company BB's management team ever listed in the company's related party dealings? Not, I don't understand that. Right, we'll get to that question to you. Okay. Now, were RFG shareholders ever made aware of this strategy that you um, agreed to with Mr Alford and was known to the senior legal counsel of, um, of it, RFG? It was definitely known to the senior... Well, yeah, because Colin Archer was the one that told me, well, accidentally slapped me on the back and congratulated me on the new gig before I even knew. So... Um, Andre Nell, he was, he knew. They were, the, the, the four of, like the th those three, Andre Nell, Colin Archer and Tony Alford, they were, they were, we were doing it together. Okay, so you've said Mr, you described Mr Alford's role as, what was Mr Alford? T Tony, he, yeah. he was the boss. And 
what were the other two? What roles did they oh, hold? Oh, Colin Archer, he was the chair. Yep. Um, of and the board? Of the board, yep. And, um, and Andre Nell was a general manager of Retail Food Group. Okay, so they're all very senior people. Um, they would have had some responsibilities to shareholders when they listed this company. Yeah. Uh, are you aware, Mr Burke or Mr Mason, um, if RFG shareholders were ever aware of the strategy that has, was employed uh, look, with BB's management team? I would say no, um, on the basis that I was still getting asked by franchisees around the place, what's going on? What, you know, what are you doing here? So when there I'd was be... no public disclosure no. of any of this as far as no. you're aware, Mr Burke? Anything no. from you, Mr Mason, on no, that? No, I've, I've never seen any public disclosure. Check with us. Yeah, so RFG's annual reports for the past five years make zero mention of Exit 57 investments. Um, that arrangement's not listed in the company's related parties' dealings. So I, I'm interested to see if you've got any light to shed on how this could occur given that the ASX requires a company to declare related party deals in its annual report. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't, yeah, I, I, I don't want to surmise, but uh, I, I don't know how that could happen either. So there's missing information that you believe is not in the public realm? Well, uh, Alicia Atkinson definitely took responsibility for those stores under Exit 57. That's that's well documented and well publicised. Okay. Baden and Mr Randy, Burke, you the undertook model. the stores? Yeah. You undertook stores as well? She yeah. took undertook different stores? She, she undertook, from, from what I remember, it was Donut King and Michelle's Patisserie. Okay. And Mr Burke, through BB's management team, you undertook the it, Brumbies, Brumbies Bakery stores? Brumbies. In a similar model? Exactly, yeah, same model. Excellent. Um, Do you she believe... Taught, she was the one that sort of helped me set it up. Yep. You know, you she can make money here. Yeah. Yeah. There yep. was also a discussion with Baden to take over some some, some of the pizza pizza, stores pizza as well capers and other, as they got further yeah. into the arrangement. Okay. Yeah. So this was a model of business that they were operating across a number of their brands. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, Mr. And Burke, do you believe there were any other entities that operated in the same way apart from BB's management team and Exit Fifty Seven Investments Proprietary Limited. Look, yeah, there was a actually there was a guy in Sydney that had Donut Kings that came on one of these car racing ventures with me, who was offered. He was, I know, he was offered the deal. Uh, like uh, he was offered the same sort of scenario. I'm not sure if he took it on or not. Okay, um, so we're talking about um, a business model of sorts that yep. is embedded within RFG that was being implemented across a number of brands to the best of your knowledge. Yeah. But none of this so far, we've been able to find anything listed on the ASX or mm. revealed in any end of year reports, financial reports. Okay, yeah. we'll, we'll have to look for that. Um, do you know if any of those companies uh, still exist or are in liquidation? Exit 57 and BBMT or? Yep. Both, well, both of them are bugger. Both they're of them both, are in liquidation? Yeah, they're both down. Um, what's the timeline, um, Mr Burke, around the man BB's management team? So you picked it up what year, you made the money, the change happened, then the process to liquidation. Can you take yeah. me through that timeline? Um, or do you oh, need look, to give me that on notice? Put that on notice, if, if you need exact. I'd yep. say 12 to 18 months, if, if you know, but... Okay. Yeah. Getting the exact details would be really yeah. useful. Yeah, yeah, okay. Good. Thank you. Um, One of the things that we've had in evidence is that there's a lot of control that comes, which is to create brands to sustainability and you know predictability for people getting the same thing wherever they go, etc. Um, some people describe these as restrictive business models, others call them quality control models. What power and controls did you have over the stores that you took Mr Burke? And was that the same as the sort of controls you still have, Mr Mason? Or were they very different? Controls as managing, like this, this Yeah, the like stores. what would you do? Um, yeah, look, I, look, I had sort of full control, like the, the same control. It was still my business. Yeah, like You I, still had to order all your ingredients yeah, through it was still, and Yeah, oh, yeah. They, was, they were run exactly the same as a normal franchise. Okay. Yeah. So he, he wasn't afforded any, any additional um, perceived benefits, put it that way, apart from the fact that there were no licence fees at the start. Mm. Mm. 
Okay. Um, could I go back to the moment when the company changed ownership? You entered into an agreement with one particular business model. Is it fair to say that the business model completely changed on the change of ownership? Or was it still substantially the same? Which, which, which from, from Sherlock to from Sherlock Sher to RFT? Oh, yeah. No, look, I mean, it, it was roughly roughly the same. There was nothing that, that you could see on the surface that was that had changed dramatically. We still paid our eight and a half percent. They still sent out their um, you know their, their BDMs, the business development managers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It was it was like a death by a thousand cuts over a period of time where things were systematically stripped out piece by piece by piece by piece by piece and, um, you know, that's... What are some of those examples other than the BDMs you referred to earlier? Basically, the BDMs disappeared, you were saying, Steve. What, what are the other things that... Um, look, uh, there are a lot, of, um, a lot of internal changes as well um, where... You'd, you'd ring up one day and you'd have, like what Baden alluded to before, you'd have one um, a marketing uh, executive for argument's sake, I don't know the exact terminology, for Brumbies, another one for Donut King, another one for Michelle's. And then all of a sudden you'd ring up and this person becomes more and more hard to get a hold of and you realise that that, that person's now looking after three brands. Yeah, efficiency models they call that usually. So mm. that, that, I guess that's what I'm getting at is, is that, you know, those sorts of, those sorts of things that, that people rely fairly heavily on or the majority of the network rely heavily on just, just disappeared. So and what you were getting for your 8.5% on one day was very different to what you were getting for your 8.5%. Well, see, the business model, when, when we entered into it, we, we saved roughly 10% on our cost of goods across the board. And to the best of my knowledge, at that point when we entered into the arrangements in 2004, there were no rebates. Or if they were, they were insignificant compared to what they are now. Uh. Um, and that, that, I guess that's what I'm trying to say about the transparency, where there is no transparency. You know, ideally, RFG... And they're not required to tell you about these changes. They have arbitrary power to make these changes without any consultation with you. Is that correct? I, I, look, I don't, I, I'm not in a position to answer that. I've never read that document. The document is well in excess of 300 pages. Um, some of the things that, again, that I've been told the over the years- The disclosure document that are in the, the Yeah, and mm -hmm. the licence agreement. Yeah. Um, but, but it's very lopsided. So what recommendations should we make around those documents? Because we're being told, you know, that. The best way to get around it, some people have said, oh, just make sure that they go and get legal advice and they need to sign a waiver to say that they've got legal advice. So the issue, mm. the issue, is, the issue is then is that, let's say for argument's sake, when you go into the, your or, original arrangement with the franchisor, um, everybody has the rose-coloured glasses, et cetera, et cetera. You go in there, um, you know, blah, blah, blah. When you come to renew five years later, it's the same document. If you don't sign that document, you're out. That, that, that's a real problem. Um, because so one of the things we've been considering is that, you know, we, we, we heard evidence today that there's synergies between, like, the nature of the contract but also the relational dimension of this, that at the outset you need not only the contract about what you're entering into begin, but you need a divorce document in preparation. So it becomes clear that you may or may not have goodwill. Yeah. It becomes clear that you may or may not have the capacity to purchase on further. We're hearing that kind of recommendation that you, you need to have the document for separation embedded in the commencement. Yeah. So... Yes or no, do you think that's a good idea? Yeah, I, I think that's a great idea. Um, I, I've, I've looked at a couple of business models subsequent to RFG because I, I need a life after this to try to support my family and so on and so forth. And, um, you know, in, in quite a lot of these franchise arrangements that work really well, um, there are examples of um, scenarios where people just give each other 30 days notice and take the signs down and part and go their separate ways. And um, That's agreed at the commencement of the negotiations. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In one instance, I've, I've, I've investigated a brand um, which is Australia-wide 800 stores, which is in growth. Um, their, their document is two pages. That's it. Just and it's written in plain English. When RFG took over from Sherlock's, you only make the bread, the other cakes and pies and that are brought into your stores, correct? Um, yeah, look, that's, that's, a fair, that, that's a fair representation. It's not... Well, did you lose profit margin for those 
out-of-store out supplies to your store once RFG had taken over? Did they increase their price no, there? No, not straight away. No, that, that, that's what I'm saying. It was death by a thousand cuts. So, so basically what happened is in an effort to, to keep everything looking the same, pies and so on and so forth were, were bought in frozen and that, that was the case under Sherlock and it's still the case with RFG. There were other things that were bought in, you know, frozen, freezer to oven that we basically came in in a big box, put in a prover, put in an oven, bake them off, put them in the cabinet. Um, we actually make more in Brumbies now than we did when Brumbies was owned by Michael Sherlock because people have found innovative ways to cut costs around, around that, but it, it's still not enough. So that, that, that didn't change. It did change with some of the other brands, some of the other submissions that I've read, but, but not in Brumbies. Right. So, Steve, what would your advice be? I mean, <clears throat> you know, you've got a change in ownership and, you know, some advice or evidence we've received is, you know, there should be a right for someone like you to essentially terminate the agreement if ownership changes. <clears throat> I mean, thinking about that practically, you're saying your evidence to us now is things didn't drastically change on day one, putting your situation aside, Baden. Um, so presumably, you know, there could be circumstances where ownership changes and things just run along merrily for a period of time and then perhaps by the time they change, your ability to then terminate is over anyway. What, how do we get around that, if anything? Because here you're saying it's sort of like death by a thousand cuts. It happened over a period of time. Yeah. You know, this, the event that occurs that sort of would enable you to make a decision is presumably the ownership change. Yeah. yeah it's not something you can have forever, I, I wouldn't have thought. Mm. What, what are you, what's your advice to mm. us as someone who's lived through it? Um, look, I mean, as it stands, I can only, I can only answer the, the situation I'm currently in. As it stands at the moment, I've got three stools. Um, one of those stools would be in the top five or six stools in, 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 in the Brumbies network, nationally. Um, I've had those stores on the market for five months. Um, I haven't had anybody come through to inspect those stores. When you say they're in the top five, I mean, the pro in turnover, yeah. profitability? No, turnover. In turnover. Yeah, so they're successful businesses. Yeah. Um, and, and, and all three of those stores are, are profitable. So I'm now in a situation where I, I want to relocate my family um, to Queensland. I've done everything I need to do. Um, the stores look good. Finance, financials are, are fine, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I talked to my um, agent on a fortnightly basis, and he says that as soon as they find out their franchise bakeries, and as soon as they find out their Brumbies bakeries, people just disappear. So if I was to take the signs down um, and increase my profitability, see, this is the thing at the moment, for the 8.5%, which is a, around $5,000 a week, mm that I contribute to Retail Food Group, um, <coughs> I, I get nothing. I get nothing back at all. I can go out to Costco and buy a bag of flour, a dollar a bag cheaper mm. off the shelf out there as an individual, same quality. Same it doesn't quality. matter what they say, that, 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 that's it's not based in fact. Um, you know, I can buy two litres of milk at the IGA across the road for the same price that I buy in a network of 1,350 stores, um, and in some cases cheaper. Um, so there's no incentive for people to want to join um, a brand like this at the moment. Um, if I was to take the signs down, um, those businesses are probably worth 750000 Each? Oh, no, cumulatively. And what's stopping you from doing that, Steve? Uh, well, the fact that... Um, the fact that... Well, look, the, the fact is I don't actually have licences at the moment. Um, I get phone calls on a regular basis from Retail Food Group to try to entice me to come back and sign. Sorry, you don't have licences? Yeah, my licences have expired. So you don't have a relationship with them any longer? Oh, no, I do. I, I do. I have a financial relationship with them because I, I pay. I still pay the 8.5% every week. Their signs are above the top of my stores. The reason I don't take those down is for fear of legal legal ramifications because in the past what's happened is people have tried to debrand their stores RFG have gone in and executed their powers under their license agreements or their documents or whatever it is whatever whatever the document is that it's signed and they just kick the people out so are you saying your license term with them has expired yes when yeah. did that happen Mr. Uh, look it's been over a period of um, probably the last 18 months the most recent one the third the third one expired on the 27th of uh, July, 23rd of July this year. But despite that happening, 
you cannot walk away from this because and you're in this sort of no man's yeah, land. That's right. Which is partly to do with the contract you've signed, I'm assuming. Um, I or think, it's just fear. Uh, I, I, I you don't strike me as a very fearful person. I haven't gone into. I don't really want to say too much. Yep, sure. In this in this forum because yep. it, it's it's you know. It's public. Big yes. It's a public forum. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, yeah, that's fine, yeah. Mr. Mason. I, I, I appreciate you yeah. know, what you've already put on the public record. Yeah, um, but it is interesting for us to hear that there's a period where a licence completes, and then there's this uncertain interim period where you're not sure about what your rights are and what you can do and what you can't do, and how do you get out of this? Yeah, Sorry, is that, is that a, a, a well-founded uncertainty? I mean, is are the examples? I would have thought once the agreement ceases, that's it. You can take. The sign down and no. Well, look, I, I, I wish I was a little bit better prepared for these you questions don't. because I, I could I could probably provide a, a copy of the license agreement that I signed um, that has that, that 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 where they have expired. Um, RFG are quite actively pursuing my landlords to get my landlords to re-sign leases with RFG. They're they're actively and 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 positively pursuing me as well to re-sign for another five years and so on and so forth. The issue for me is that once I do that, they want around about $20,000 per site for a system that doesn't work. And no one can show me any evidence of the fact that that system is turned around and there's no guarantee that system's gonna work in the future. In fact, I, I, from, from what I gather, the financial position is pr precarious to say the least. So Mr. Mason, if you wanted to resolve this matter, uh, how, how, do, how would you think about going about that? Is there a mediation path that you can follow um, that you're aware I, of? I have, I have actually approached Retail Food Group and Richard Hinson personally yep. um, to, uh, to, to let me out of, of the agreements. Um, and look, you know, Richard was quite helpful. He said, look, um, there are a few things that we need to discuss, a few avenues that we need to pursue um, before we look at anything else. Yep, so, so don't go any further about your person's circumstances. Right. My, my question is really, um, are you aware of a mediation path? If that all falls apart, I hope that you know Mr Hinson actually um, resolves this matter with you yeah. as a matter of goodwill. Um, but if that doesn't happen, are you aware of a mediation path that you can take? No, or so... You don't know about what, that what, stuff? What I'm, what I'm aware of is that th this situation happened in far north Queensland um, a couple of years ago where a lady debadged two of her stores. Right. The debadging process is quite uh, not common, but people do go down that path. But in order to do that, um, the advice that, that people seek or the, the advice that people are given from legal people is that they need to find uh, a proxy, so to speak, to go in, take the head lease away, um, because RFG no longer have access to the buildings if they don't have the head lease. And if the landlords don't want to re-sign, then you, you get to a moot point where you're kind of stuck. Right. Um, and I'm fairly sure in that document, we are prohibited as, as, as ex-franchisees to negotiate with the landlord. Um, and I think RFG gets first right of refusal. There's some complicated um, scenario that goes on there. It's not straightforward. Right. Otherwise, people at the end of their term, like if it, if it was straightforward... They'd just take the signs my, down and keep going. My signs would be gone. Yeah. They yep. would have been gone at the last uh, maturity of the last licence agreement six, seven years ago. Yeah. So, um, so most of the time it's, it's smoke and mirrors. And then there's restrictive trading around. You can't set up in a place nearby, even if you've got that customer goodwill and all that sort of I stuff. I suspect that is the case. I'm not yeah. sure. I've never yeah. read the document. Okay, so one of the things that's clear to us is that people aren't aware of what mediation might be available to them. They're not. They're certainly not clear about what an exit strategy might look like because that's not discussed early on. Uh, and the other thing we've become aware of is even if people do get to the stage where mediation occurs, that there is no arbitration which says you must do this to get the matter finished. So uh, Yeah, well, the, the, there's a gentleman that I referred to before there who, who is in Far North Queensland at the moment. Um, he closed his store, uh, I think it was in November last year, wouldn't have been November last year, but earlier this year, but about six months ago. Um, and he is, he's, yeah, I won't say too much more, yeah. which might identify him, but he's now in a situation where... Um, He's contacting RFG twice a week 
trying to get through to somebody who is in a senior position who can make these types of decisions because he's still being sent invoices for rent for a store that he closed six months ago. Right. And it, it just doesn't seem like there's anything that's proactive that's happening. So shut whilst, whilst yeah. RFG hold the head lease and they sort of... Um, they come across as if that's very noble and, and honourable and so on and so forth and that they're at the mercy of uh, the landlords and so on and so forth. Behind their head lease is a signature with a personal guarantee, mm. unlimited personal guarantee from each and every franchisee who Ooh. signs those documents. Mm. So RFG on, on the surface are responsible for the rent but then they turn around and counter sue people for their losses. Yeah, okay. Now, I'm conscious of time, Thank but you. I, I just want to clear something in my own mind. So, Baden, back to you, your circumstance. You had discussions, you entered into you know, an arrangement where you took on these stores, underperforming stores, yep. you turned some of them around by the sound of it. Yep. Then the critical moment occurred when all of a sudden, th they were profitable on the basis that there was no 8.5% management fee. Yep. An event occurred that then imposed that eight and a half percent management fee. Now, presumably, that was something that was um, allowed under the agreements that you'd entered into, the formal agreements. Well, it was just a, a, a handshake agreement with Tony, the the, the, the whole setup to to start with. But well, well, um, in the end, once they were imposed on you, you you yeah. you executed contracts that. Presumably allowed for you know if, if there's a an event including a change of ownership at that point in time management fee could be charged. That was the diff in the end that was the difference between being profitable and not. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. And the money. See, I'm just trying to and maybe I'm a bit slow. I'm just trying to understand the financial arrangement here. You were getting paid, you know, a. a a grand a week, or a grand a week plus seven fifty. No, se yeah, seven hundred and fifty dollars a week. Seven fifty a week. You had a thousand up front or something. Yeah, yeah. thousand dollars up front per store. Per store. Yeah. Sign then seven fifty a week. Yeah. And you were responsible for everything else. Yeah. And the, and um, the debt that you had taken on the eight hundred thousand dollars. No, that never no, eventuated. That never happened. That never ultimately. That was twenty thousand dollars per store that you got. How, how many loans did you draw a, down, those loans, those $20,000 loans? Uh, 180000 I think it oh. was, or $160,000. Eight or nine. So, yeah. So in the yeah. wash-up, of all the stores you had, were any of them profitable after you, the 8.5% management fee was imposed? Look, there, there would have been a few profitable still, but as a group, it, it wouldn't have... But collectively, no. Yeah, collectively, no. So the debt in the end, at what point did you sort of, were you able to then cut your losses and move on? You, it, look, it, that all happened in 10 minutes in that room. So at that point? I did look, yeah. I had the general manager sitting beside me, the, 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 he's the only person I was worried about because it was his job. Um, so that's, that's my, the BB's management team general manager. But... Um, because I made it real clear that it wasn't going to happen. But did you think it was realistic that you'd never be charged a management fee, ever? Yeah, look, look, w the road that we were taking with BB's management team running the brand, which the meetings were just within that last week of this happening, the, we would have been running it, uh, we wouldn't have needed it. It was all in the budget of RFG were going to pay BB's management team to run the brand. So in that budget, was the the company stores in that 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 in the that I put together? Um, there was an allowance for those stores, um, so it, no. I, to answer your question, I don't I don't think that that would the BB's management team was never going to run forever with them paying me to do it, um, but. Once they started talking to me and, and talking to BB's management team about running the brand, that was a different ball game. That was, the, you know, it was. Uh, look, I just forget. Uh, we were going to we were going to be charging them about half a half a million dollars a year to to run Brumbies um, because that's what we estimated. Well, we we'd done the numbers of what they were spending on their BDMs, their general manager, so on and so forth. So. Um, I think, can I just 
jump yeah. in, mate. I think yeah. what, what you're trying to ascertain and, and what in my mind was happening at that stage was Baden had got to a point where it was running those stores, some of those stores were profitable, but it was nowhere near enough to be able to prop up the, the bleeding that was happening out of the $4,000 or $7,000 a week stores. So it all looked good coming in the front door. Um, then what happened was RFG, around that same time they were trying to raise money for their next acquisition, um, were reassessing internally how they would run the business. Now, what Baden's saying is, is that they approached him not to take over the brand, but to take over the, the management of their staff that were associated with the Brumbies brand. Um, so the, the BDMs, the business development managers. Now, at that stage, there were, I'm not sure, I think it was, say, between 10 and 14 of those staff staff members. If Baden's quoted them 500,000 to run that, that even that team of people without general managers, which I think, what, what were you paying your general manager, 120? Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. So, you know... Um, but Steve, if you, and Baden, I mean, if you're taking on a loan per store, I mean, you, you've now got a stake in that. You know, you're not just there essentially being paid for your management expertise. You've got a, st you, you know, I've got a stake in this because I'm mm. taking out a loan, putting in my own dough into this, right? Mm. So I, I'm just struggling to understand whether your handshake agreement was, Baden, we need you to step in and fix these stores for us because you've got the expertise and we're going to just pay you to do it or you're going to have a stake in these things and if you turn them around, you know, you're going to, you're going to enjoy the upside of them. When we sell them. When you ultimately... When we sell... Yeah, well, and there was... Because that was the plan, wasn't it? That yeah. you got them going and then they would sell them and you would get money from that sale. The sale no, not... If it, if it sold for good money, there was a, there was a bit of... There was a, a document. If it was sold... Like, say, for example, that store owed RFG on the books $70,000 for the yep. plant equipment or, or the rent, the lost rent or whatever. Uh, anything over and above that, I got a percentage of. Right. So we, if they sold it for $150,000, then they would give me 10 or 20% of the, 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 the profit that they made. Right. That was, but I, uh, that, wasn't my, that wasn't my focus. I was, I was just focusing on running the brand, running Brumbies, you know, getting I, them... Getting I, think it, them. I think it's important to revisit this scenario because this is quite critical, where they try to get Baden to take over the, the, the running of, of the brand, mm. as he keeps saying. There's no way in the world for half a million dollars they would have... He would have covered the wages for 12 people. Yeah. Let alone the travel, let alone all the other expenses it, because all, all of that was part of the deal, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, they knew again that in that scenario that it may have been cost, who knows what it cost them. Let's say, for argument's sake, it was a million to run that. Then they approached him to say, well, you know, what do you think you could do it for? It's just another cost-cutting exercise around that period of time. And, and in your view, Mr Mason, was this to um, remove from their business sheet... I can only speculate that that was the case. Debts, so that they looked more favourable. Yeah, speculate now, Stephen. Yeah, we are. The, the, each of these individuals have been given many opportunities yeah. to appear. So, uh, I'm, it, it on, just, on, on, on relevant things, I'm happy yeah. to already speculate. Not, not One final question for me to both of you. Did RFG act in an ethical way to you, Baden? No. No. Thank you. There's no way in the world you can have as many submissions as, as, as you guys have from as many people, decent, hard-working people, as you can have when people are acting ethically in the best interests of their network. It just doesn't happen. You've got networks that are out there that are acting ethically. Their franchisees are happy. They're making money. Mm. They're prospering. They're doing well. And, I mean, who are the individuals that have acted unethically, in your view? Well, yep. I think it's the people we've been talking about tonight. Mm. Look, you know, again, it's a, it's a pretty difficult question to answer um, because... I would say Tony Alford, because he, he was the boss. 
He, and even in that office, I spent many times in his, in his office in the senior management department of RFG, which not very many people got to get into. Um, but, there but, you, but you had a lot of access to him personally until a certain point. Yeah. That's your evidence. Yeah. And, um, and he ran the show. He did, 100%. Um, yeah. We'd like to talk to him. Yeah, it would be be worth your while sitting in, sitting talking with Tony. We've been trying to. Oh, have you? No. Yeah. <laughs> we don't. Yeah, we don't need to get into that any further. Right. All right. Well, it, um, it, Steve and Baden. I mean, is there anything further that either we haven't asked or you haven't included in any of your statements that you that you wanted to um, convey to us tonight? Um, look, I'll just I'll just say. Look, going back to the shares and the shareholders. Can I say, I just noticed the graph there the other day of the share price of RFG. When Exit 57, Proprietary Limited, and BB's management team, Proprietary Limited, started, when they started, that was the height of RFG. $6.72? That's, that's when, yeah, that's, that, that was at the peak. Um, so... They looked pretty good and shiny at that moment. Yeah. And then... then then things went down, so, yeah. I had um, a landlord of mine and another business I operate here in Canberra ring me to, um, he got advice from a, a broker to purchase RFG shares and he rang me and he said, you're involved with them, would you buy their shares? I said, there's no, no way in the world. At, at that point, that, that was a hollow ship that was sailing across for all intents and purposes. It looked, it looked amazing, but the people who who knew the brand, who were inside the brand, the franchisees, we, we all knew this was going to happen two years ago because everybody could see how much stuff had been stripped out. You could see the way the business was heading. There's no, no question that that was where it was going to end up. Mr Burke, when you locate your documents, I'd like to understand how long the term of your agreement was for. Yeah. Um, because that would, that would be interesting. Yeah and uh, see if that matches up with the verbal commitments that you believe you were given and that you conveyed to Mr Mason. Yep. All right, thank you. Well, thanks, gentlemen. And can I just say, in relation to any information uh, that, we've, um, that we've either requested or you've committed to provide, um, if we can have that by the 31st of October, we'd be very grateful. And can I emphasise, uh, Baden, um, uh, information, documentation that corroborates contemporaneously some of the things you've spoken about would be very useful and can we um, and I commenced this formal hearing this evening 